Hey, for those who don't know me, my name is Finn, also known as Miriam Joy, and this is the first in a series of videos in which I retell medieval Irish stories in my own words. I have a degree in Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic, throughout which I specialised in medieval Irish literature, so today I'm going to start telling you the story of Tocfoc Aidan, although it's quite a long text so I don't think I'm going to be able to do it all in one video. Conveniently, the story is actually kind of split into three parts, so I will probably just go with those divisions, we'll see how we get on and how long it takes me to tell the first part. As always, you'll have to excuse my pronunciation of the Irish names, and bear in mind that although I'm offering one interpretation or explanation of elements of the story, there are obviously alternative ways in which it can be interpreted, and my way is not necessarily the only way, and occasionally I screw up and make mistakes. So just putting those disclaimers out there. I am primarily working from the translation of the text that you'll find in Geoffrey Gant's Early Irish Myths and Sagas. It's a very serviceable translation, very convenient, and this book is only $1.99 on Kindle, which is really great if you want to read it for yourself, so I'll put a link to that in the description. If you buy it via that link, I get a tiny commission. Just put in that out there. So the first person we meet in Tokfak Aden is the Dagda. This text tells us that he can work miracles, he can control the harvest and the weather, and he's known as the Good God. So that places him pretty solidly in the mythological camp. And in classic godly fashion, the Dagda wants to sleep with somebody that he probably shouldn't sleep with. Her name is Boan, she's associated with the River Boyne, and she does want to also sleep with the Dagda, don't get me wrong, she is totally up for this, but she's married to a guy named Elkfa, and she's a bit like, mm, you know what? don't think he's going to be too happy with this. And Elkfa lives in Brugna Boyne, aka Newgrange, in the valley of the Boyne River. So the Dagda's solution to get Elkfa out of the way is to send him to visit Bresmek Elitha, and while he's gone, he casts a bunch of spells on him so that he won't notice the passing of time. So he doesn't think he's been gone very long, he isn't feeling hunger, he isn't noticing the passing of time. And so, as far as he's concerned, he's been gone for a day. He promised he'd be back by nightfall, he's gonna be back by nightfall. It's actually been nine months. Yay! Guess what happened in that nine months? Oh yeah! Bowen had a son. His name is Oingus. He's often referred to as Angus Oak. He's known as the Mac Oak, or the Young Son, because he was conceived, gestated, and born in the space of a day, as far as Elkfar is concerned, anyway. Angus Oak is a really interesting figure with regard to how he's been misinterpreted over time, and that's mostly because people were working from incomplete versions of this text. So Tokfak Aden was a bit of a weird text in terms of incomplete manuscript transmission, and it wasn't published in full until 1937, so people were working for some pretty patchy versions, and that results in some very weird ideas about Angus. And if you want to know more about the changing face of Angus and how he ended up being portrayed as the god of love, which is totally a Victorian idea and very weird, there's a great chapter on it in Ireland's Immortals by Mark Williams, which is a fantastic book if you're interested in the whole mythology gods side of medieval Irish lit, very readable, he manages to include the word sexcapades. The chapter on Angus is one of my favourites. Also because it has a picture of a painting that we nicknamed Camp Angus, because it's extremely camp and extremely hilarious, so definitely would recommend that one. I will put a link to Amazon for that in the description also. Anyway, the Dagda gives Angus to Mither to foster. Now, fosterage in medieval Irish literature is a whole different kettle of fish to modern fosterage. I'm not going to get into the very tangled nuts of loyalty and affection that it can create, because that's just a whole big issue. That's not the point right now. The most important thing is that Mither is raising Angus, seems pretty fond of him. There are like 300 other children there, and Angus is the leader of them because he's the most handsome, he's the most noble, and Mither likes him. However, he has a rival. His rival is a kid named Triath, who is also being fostered by Mither, and Angus at this point doesn't know who his parents are. If anything, he thinks Mither is his dad, he thinks he's gonna ascend to Mither's kingship one day in the future, and he thinks therefore that he's superior to Triath. Triath, however, has other ideas, and one day they're having a bit of an argument, and Angus says some very uncharitable things about Triath, and Triath accuses him of being a foundling who has neither father nor mother, and therefore no right to speak to him like that. Obviously, this upsets Angus, who goes running to Mither crying, saying, He says I don't have any parents! How rude! And Mither is like, Okay, yeah, at this point I should probably tell you, I do know who your parents are. I am not your dad. Your dad is the Dagtha, and your mum is Burn, wife of Elkfa. I'm looking after you because obviously Elkfa does not want to know about this. So Angus asks if he can meet his father, have his heritage recognised, his inheritance, and so on, and Mither agrees to this. So they go together to where the Dagda lives, in Meath, in the centre of Ireland, 
and Mithir introduces Angus to the doctor, who acknowledges him as his son, but says that he can't really do anything about giving him inheritance because the place he has set aside for Angus to one day rule is Brunaboyne. You know, Newgrange, where Elkfar lives. The guy that the doctor cuckolded when he fathered Angus. I have no wish to disturb him further, says the doctor at this point, as though sleeping with someone's wife is equivalent to ringing them up late at night and being kind of a nuisance. Why is he like this? So the doctor instead gives Angus some advice. He says that he should go to Brunaboyne at Samhain, that's Halloween to most of us, because that's a day of peace and friendship, it's his best bet at not getting stabbed on sight. He should go armed, though, and he should threaten Elkfar to kill him if he doesn't give him what he wants. And what he should ask for in that request is that he should have the kingship of Brunaboyne for a day and a night. But, says the doctor, do not yield it back to him unless he yields to my judgment on the matter. So Angus does this, he goes to Brunaboyne, he threatens Elkfar, he gets his request, and when Elkfar comes to reclaim his land at the end of the next day, he says, you gave me kingship for day and night, and the whole world passes in days and nights, so therefore I'm the ruler of Brunaboyne for as long as I want to be. And Elkfar is like, damn it. So, they appeal to the Dagda, and the Dagda obviously takes Angus's side here. Now, Elfar is surprisingly chill about giving up his land here, especially when the Dagda gives him instead some land at this place called Claytech, but you do feel like he's been a little bit hard done by it. First the Dagda slept with his wife, now the Dagda's son has stolen his kingdom. Medieval Irish texts love doing this, by the way following the letter of an agreement, but not the spirit of it. I guess it's where in folklore you get this idea that you can make bargains with fairies as long as you, like, very much make sure there isn't a different way it can be interpreted. That is absolutely what's going on here. A year later, Mither comes to visit Angus because, you know, he's his foster son. Angus is hanging out at Brunaboyne, watching a couple of groups of young boys playing, and in the distance at Claytech, Elkfar is watching them too. He's just kind of staring. I don't know how far apart these two places are. It's possible that he has very alarmingly good eyesight or he's sitting there with a telescope or something. Point is, he has got his eye on his old kingdom. Bit of a scuffle breaks out among the boys and Mithira says to Angus, just stay here, don't go out there and deal with it because if you get involved in that, Elfar is gonna come and invade while you're busy. So Mithira goes forward to break up the fight between the two boys but he gets caught in a crossfire, someone throws a bit of holly and it takes out his eye. Ouch. Now, Mither, understandably, is a little bit distressed by this turn of events, but not for the reasons you'd expect. Obviously, losing an eye is not fun for anyone, but it's a particular problem for Mither with regard to the rules about kingship. You see, the thing about medieval and mythological Ireland is that a king has to be physically perfect. If you are blemished, you can't be king. So Mither has lost his eye, which means he's also going to lose his kingship, which is just adding insult to injury at this point. And yeah, this is a hellishly ableist rule, and it's also a plot point in several texts. Point is, Mither has lost his eye, he's gonna lose his kingdom, and he goes to Angus in a crisis like, oh my god, I should never have come to visit you. Look what's happened, I'm losing my kingship, I'm losing my honour, I'm losing everything that is meaningful to me. I should have just left you well alone. And Angus is like, okay, chillax. I've got this. I'm gonna get the healer Dian Kert, and he's gonna treat your eye, and everything is gonna be fine. So Angus gets Dian Kert, who heals Mither's eye, and at the end of it, Mither is like, okay, okay, it's great that you've healed me and everything, but I have to go. I have already been here too long. And Angus is like, no, no, stay here for a bit, don't go. Angus seems quite attached to his foster dad. I mean, as far as I can work out, he can't be more than about 11 at this point, because he was fostered for nine years, and then the whole shenanigans with Bruno Boyne happened, and then with Elkar, and then it's been a year. So I feel like he's definitely not an adult. But there is a lot of chronological weirdness in texts like this, so, you know, who knows how old Angus is. Point is, he's probably fairly young and he doesn't want his foster dad to leave. He's like, stay for a year, meet everyone, see what my kingdom's like, it'll be great. And Mither is a calculating dude, so he's like, well, I'll stay if you make it worth my while. He wants something, and Angus knows it, and he says, what is it that you want from me, Mither? And Mither says, I want a chariot, I want some nice clothes, and I want the most beautiful woman in Ireland. And Angus says, well, I can get you the chariot, and I can get you the clothes, but I'm not sure about the most beautiful woman in Ireland. I mean, isn't that kind of thing kind of subjective? Like, how am I meant to know my standards are even the same as yours? And Mither's like, oh, it's fine, I know who I want. Her name is Aidan. And Angus is like, okay, so like every other woman in Ireland then. Which is not what he actually says, but he would be totally justified if he did, because everyone seems to be called Aidan. And Mither says she's from Ulster. Her dad is Aelil, who is a king in 
Ulster. Yeah, I know there's a king of Connacht in the toy called Ailil. Again, very common name, very confusing. I need Aidan, daughter of Ailil, from Ulster. And Angus is like, well, guess I'll go get you Aidan, daughter of Ailil from Ulster. And so he goes in search of her. Now you might think, given that the story is literally called The Warring of Aiden, that she'd have turned up before now, but uh, you'd be wrong. But the story of what happens once Aiden gets involved is going to be the subject of a whole other video. So tune in next time to see the Dactyl's adventures in magical landscape gardening and some very, very weird shape-shifting. In the meantime, if you want to read the story for yourself, there's one in Geoffrey Gant's Early Irish Myths and Sagas that's pretty solid. If you've learned something from this video, then please subscribe to get more videos on the subject. And also there's a link to my coffee account in the description if you want to tip me and support my continued medievalist endeavours. No pressure, but it's there. I will see you soon for more of Tochwerk Aiden. Bye!